Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the mailbox for the 27th of September 2011. My name is Total Biscuit, bringing you your daily dose of community interaction, gaming discussion, and all that good stuff. You can email in mailbox at cynicalbrit.com. That is mailbox at cynicalbrit.com with topics for future shows. The game in the background is a bit of League of Legends Dominion. That's the new mode available for it, kind of a Wrathy Basin style. It's pretty neat. It is not a good gameplay, I might point out. It is actually fairly terrible. But. It's just gameplay to go in the background. It's just what I happened to have on at the time. So, yeah. Simple as that. Apologies for not doing a mailbox in a little while. I think you all know the reasons for it. If you do not, let me reiterate. I was not doing mailbox because I was traveling and dealing with the Eurogamer Expo and then the Dignitas Invitational. And then I got back home and I was also sick for quite some time. Some of you might be aware I caught something in Spain. Thankfully not an STD. No, it was airborne. So don't you even dare make a comment on it. I know how you are, you filthy minded fiends. The first email comes in from Nick that says, I just turned 30 last week, congratulations, and it got me thinking about my gaming lifestyle. Do you feel there's an age that we all should cut down on our gaming time, or in fact, get rid of it completely? I'm not referring to the people that play five or so hours a week. I'm talking about people like me who still game 20 to 40 hours a week and more if they can. I feel there's a social stigma with gaming and age. I'm a competitive athlete and soon to be an officer in the Air Force. Most people give a raised eyebrow when they see that I'm such a big gamer. As if I shouldn't be doing this at my age or something. I will admit I'm a borderline addict to gaming and often put it ahead of other priorities in life, but that's a different topic for another day. You're 27 now and soon will be 30. Soon? Well, three years, but there you go. How long do you see yourself in the gaming circle? 40? 50? And if you do stop, do you still think it'll be your own choice or partly due to society stigma on gaming? I'm sure it will be accepted more and more since our generation, that's anyone born after 1980, has had video games as part of their lives since they could walk, but it does feel like slow progress. Well, I think you just answered your own question, really. You just said that it's becoming more and more accepted. Yeah, pretty much is. And the reason it's becoming more and more accepted is that the generation that matters, i.e. our generation, are the ones that grew up with video games. And they are then the generation that spawned the next generation. So you've got a generation that is accepting of video games, so who are very much involved with gaming growing up, who have seen its evolution over the course of the last 30 or so years, and they then pass their love of video games onto their kids, because let's be honest, multiplayer video gaming with your family is a good way of spending quality family time. It is infinitely better than watching a movie or watching television. Yes, I did just say that. Watching television and watching, say, a movie is by far a worse way of spending quality family time than gaming. You want to know why? Because it's a non-interactive medium. In fact, talking during a movie or television means you can't hear what's being said. And that, in fact, I find obnoxious. I hate people that talk during movies. It gets on my nerves. I want to watch the movie. I'm not interested in your inane blather, unless, of course, you happen to be employed by the company called Rift Tracks. Aside from that, no, I don't want to hear your stupid comments on this movie. This movie costs millions upon millions of dollars to make. It has loads of high-profile actors, a great epic sweeping story, amazing visuals. I'm fairly sure that what comes out of your mouth cannot compare to that. And more to the point, I might add, you just sit there with your family watching a movie. Is that quality family time? Are you engaging with your family in any real respect? No, you just happen to be in the same freaking room. How is that quality family time exactly? I understand the idea of, say, taking an outing to the cinema, followed perhaps by something to eat at a restaurant. That's kind of cool. That's a good family experience there. Sitting at home watching TV together? No, I don't view that as socially bonding at all. In fact, I view that as extremely antisocial. And people that believe that that is a serious social activity that is somehow more socially acceptable than gaming, or indeed more socially valuable than gaming, are actually insane. There's something wrong with them. Now, when it comes down to gaming with, say, the family, that is very much an interactive and competitive experience. There's nothing wrong with that. Nurturing the competitive spirit and indeed nurturing the cooperative spirit, which has, in fact, become very prevalent in, say, the last five or so years of gaming. Co-op gaming has really got going there. You've also got an active type of gaming in the form of Connect the Wii and, of course, the PlayStation Move, things like that. There's all sorts of different things that you can end up doing there. So to be honest, I think gaming as part of your life is probably here to stay. Games, just like television, just like books, just like movies, just like music, can be aimed at an infinite number of demographics. 
It's as simple as that. There is no limitation on that. You know, I don't know anyone that doesn't listen to music. I don't know anyone that hasn't read a book, although I'm sure there are some, but I don't tend to associate with those people. I don't know anyone that hasn't watched or enjoyed some kind of television program or movie. They are made for everybody. Games can be made for everybody. They didn't used to be, but it's gotten to that point where they are. It's just a simply a, another form of media that is most likely going to become the dominant form of media in the next 20 or so years. I believe that's simply because games can do more than television, movies, books, or anything could ever do. And you might believe that's heretical, you might believe that's blasphemous if I'm talking about books, but seriously, a book cannot do the same things that a computer game can do. A book has more limitations. Doesn't mean that it's an invalid form of media, but it is a more limited form of media. Just happens to have an awful lot of history behind it. So to be honest, keep gaming for as long as you want. It's certainly something that a lot of people invest a lot of time in, and it can have potential side effects. For instance, you can just sit there playing single-player games all the time and you become a very antisocial person. There's the idea that if you have an addictive personality, the endless well, as it were, of games and the amount of time that you can sink into them can result in you doing things which could be considered unhealthy, both socially and physically. That's a problem. And the idea, of course, of shirking your priorities in order to do something that you enjoy is not typical adult behavior. Well, it's not typical responsible adult behavior. And the thing is, that counts for pretty much anything. If you are shirking your responsibilities in order to take part in a hobby, then you're not really doing it right. But the thing is, you know, you've just described. You are a competitive athlete. You're about to be a big deal in the Air Force. So why exactly is what you do in your off time an issue to anyone? I couldn't care less about social stigma. I've never cared about social stigma. I played games when games weren't called cool to play, and I continue to play games. And it's weird that we go through these two phases of where gaming sort of wasn't cool when we were kids. Some people played it, but if you played an awful lot, say on a PC or whatever, you were considered a bit of a nerd and a social outcast. And then as you get older, you go through this period where it's socially acceptable and then it becomes unsocially acceptable again. I don't give a damn what's socially acceptable, quite frankly, as long as I'm not doing anything, one, illegal, or two, something that is hurting somebody else. I will do whatever the hell I damn well please. That's the nature of being an adult. I get to make my own decisions. Nobody can tell me what to do with my free time. It's mine. It's not yours. I don't give a damn about your opinion. It's as simple as that. So, as far as I'm concerned, everything in moderation, including moderation, but do whatever the hell you please. I can see myself gaming till I die, and why not? I'm not suddenly going to take up crocheting. That I can tell you for a fact. This one is very, very simple. It comes from Dan on live. Discuss. Right, okay, well, I'll probably spend a number of mailboxes talking about on live because, let's be honest, on live is actually a fairly big deal. It's perhaps a paradigm shift in the way that we experience games and in the way that we look at how games can be delivered. We're talking about a system that is effectively hardware neutral. So I'll go over it just a little bit. I think the next mailbox would have actually had the time to really sit down with the system at home and really crack on with it is when I will talk about it in great, great detail. But I'll throw some facts out there based on what I played at the Eurogamer Expo. I spent a good 25 or so minutes with OnLive. I talked with a guy from OnLive. I interviewed him. I actually do have the footage that's going up probably within the next 24 hours. So you guys can find out a lot about the service. It was very in-depth. But the thing I find about OnLive is that it occupies this weird space that doesn't really make a lot of sense to me. As a service, it is technologically very, very cool indeed. It's very advanced. The idea of a service being platform neutral in the sense that you can stream it on pretty much whatever you want, the hardware on the other end is maxed out, and you can, say, play it on an iPad, play it on your television, future time, maybe even play it on a phone, play it on a netbook. You can avoid a lot of the technical problems that can perhaps get in the way of playing a particular game. That's all very, very cool. The main problem I've got is that who would use the service? Who is going to regularly use that service? I won't. It's no use to me. It's true. It's not. It is no use to me whatsoever. I have a powerful PC. I have no need for on live. I have all of the consoles as well. I have no need for on live. On live gaming, for me, would be an inferior experience. And I imagine it would be for a lot of people as well. So, who's going to buy it? Who's going to use this service? 
How about those who can't afford a console? Mm, no, probably not. One, it requires a fairly reasonable internet connection, which is, of course, a monthly cost. So uh, that's something to consider. Secondly, the kind of person that could afford that kind of internet connection, they could probably also afford a console. Because let's be honest, consoles are not very expensive anymore. That and consoles have numerous other advantages. Specifically, the ability to buy used games. You can't do that on, on live. So if someone is on a very, very tight budget, they may buy a second-hand console and they just may buy cheap games. I mean, there's a massive selection of 360 and PS3 games available at, say, the Game Station store, for instance, in the UK, for £5 each. And some of those games are pretty good. Now, that is a really cheap way to game. So, again, we come back to the same issue. Who is this thing aimed at? Is it aimed at people that own nothing but a netbook? Maybe. But you have to then consider, if somebody owns nothing but a netbook, they can't be all that interested in gaming anyway. I mean, really now. Once again, a console is not a very expensive thing. There is a limited market there, and you've got to think about if someone only owns a netbook because of financial restrictions, are they really going to pay £30 a pop for a virtual game? I say virtual game, it's a horrible term, but I'm using it simply because it is not a physical thing. And it's not even the same as digital distribution. It is cloud distribution, which means that you have access to the game, you buy a pass for the game, and it is not even run on your machine. There are no files that grace your hard drive, aside from, of course, what gets cached. So... That is very, very odd, isn't it? Uh, who's the service aimed at? Is it aimed at travellers? I'd certainly hope not, because if you're travelling to another country, then on live isn't going to work. If you're travelling within the same country, then you've got to think, well, am I going to have a good enough internet connection at my destination? And for instance, I could see people maybe taking the micro console, or of course just taking a netbook, and then using that. But then you think, well, I can use it on the train. No, you can't, because you're not going to have a reliable enough internet connection on a train. Where are you going to use it? In a hotel? You don't know if the internet's good enough. So that's kind of weird. And then, of course, you've got the idea that some people do own high-spec laptops and can run this stuff anyway on the move. So it comes back to the same question again. Who is this service for? And you know what? I can't figure it out. I cannot think about who this service is actually aimed at. It's not to say that it's a bad service, it's actually quite cool, and there's a number of features that I do like. For instance, the ability to demo any game for 30 minutes, that's great. The ability to rent PC games, that is great. The ability to buy a monthly pass, which gives you access to most of the titles, so that you can just sort of dip into things every now and again. Maybe you're not a big gamer, but you like variety, and you can't really afford to drop £30 a time on a game. So, yeah, the Play Pass bundle is a good bet. But there are other things to consider. For instance, you might think, well, OnLive is aimed at the demographic that don't have very powerful PCs right now. Okay, what happens when they upgrade? And this is going to be in their mind, because then they can suddenly play that game at high spec. And yet, the game is on OnLive. It's not on Steam, they can't download it. Now, this comes down to the limitations of OnLive. And the limitations of OnLive specifically are the fact that it is streamed over the internet, and as such, it uses a lossy video stream. It has to. That's the only way to do it. It is lossy. Kind of like what you're watching on YouTube right now. If you're looking very, very closely, you'll find that in everyone's footage, especially of games, it's a bit blocky in places, particularly if it moves rather fast. And often you'll find that maybe the center of the screen, where you're sort of looking at the most, that's, that's pretty crisp. But some of the outside stuff that you maybe don't notice so much unless you're looking for it, that's a bit blocky. And that's because that's the compression algorithm. Let's be honest, uncompressed video yeah, you ain't gonna be seeing that an awful lot. I have uncompressed video on my hard drive. I have an entire hard drive dedicated to that stuff. The only way to deliver that content over the internet, especially in a streaming format, is to use a lossy codec. And what they've come up with is very, very good for what it is, but it is also very noticeable. So if you're playing a game over that service, it's not going to be as good as it would be on your PC. I mean, for instance, it's running at 720p. A lot of those games we saw running at 30 frames per second. Apparently, it can manage 60, but I haven't seen any evidence of that as of yet. So, you sit in a computer and you play an on-live game, and you will notice 
those problems. It's going to be less obvious on, say, a netbook screen and certainly on an iPad, but you will see it on a reasonable sized PC monitor. And what happens when you then upgrade your PC? Suddenly you've got a good PC, you've got all of these games that you paid for, and yet you can't make use of the power of your new machine. And regardless of how powerful a machine on the other end is in the cloud, you are still going to get that blocky artifacting from the compression of the video and nothing can actually change that sure they'll probably improve the codec as they go along and it will get better but i don't know who would buy those games and then think well it, but in future I, if i get a good pc and i want to run it again it's still going to look the same as it did on my old one uh, it's it's a difficult difficult thing uh, it's really really good tech i mean for instance the ability to just drop in on one of your friends and watch their game that's an awesome thing that's really cool. The rentals, the trials, all this stuff, that's great. The idea that the micro console can run USB-based devices, it's got two USB ports in the front, I can put a keyboard and mouse into it if I want, or Xbox compatible controllers, or indeed use the controller that comes with it, which is actually quite good, the exception of the D-pad positioning. And then I come back to that one question once again. Who is it for? Who uses it? Who is going to use this system? That's what gets me, and that's what I'm still trying to figure out. Needless to say, I will cover more of on live. I do have that video from Eurogamer, and I'll probably do a WTF is of it myself, just to show you exactly what to expect from the service, and show you all the features and things like that, once I get the time over the next few days. But there you go. That's my current opinion of on live, and that is, of course, subject to change based on more experience of it. Ladies and gentlemen, my name has been Total Biscuit. Thank you very much for watching the mailbox. I will see you next time. Victory!